version control. Thanks for that, I forgot. Uh, so uh, the session of course is on Git and um, it is one of the more commonly used version control systems out there. Um, you have, you still have SVN, that's another one. You still have Mercurial, that's another one. Um, and they all sort of do similar things, but they have, they have different designs. Um, and well, the commands are different and the way you collaborate with each other using these tools is different. Um, I think everyone by now is aware of GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and all of these services, which are all Git-based. Uh, I believe Mercurial still uh, is still supported by Bitbucket, uh, but I don't know if any of them still support uh, SVN. I think SourceForge is probably the only one that still supports SVN. And um, Git is now well established. It's been used in lots and lots of projects, right? So the Linux kernel, which is millions and millions of lines, is, is just uses Git. And um, not surprisingly, it is the author of the Linux kernel or the primary maintainer that came up with Git, Linus. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to um, do a walkthrough. It is intended to be hands-on, which is why you can see my terminal there. Um, there are uh, well, lots of user interfaces for Git, but none of them quite give you as much control as the terminal does. So it is it's designed to be a command line tool. So ideally, I would like everybody to follow the steps with me. But yeah, if you're an advanced user and you want to skip a step, that's, up, that's totally fine. But I will go step by step. Um, while we're doing that, we also have a document here, which I'll share with everybody. Um, and the idea is that um, I'll give all the commands in the chat, but I'll also give all these commands in this document that you can hopefully see in my browser. And Okay, I've just pasted a link in the chat. And um, so I'll, I'll make some notes there, but uh, please feel free to add to the document, right? So it's a living document that everybody can add information to. And the idea is that this document can then be made available with the recording of the session so that people who weren't able to, able to attend will have some notes, right? So if you have a question and uh, somebody from the session answers your question, for example, it'll be nice if that question can make it to the document along with the answer, okay? Um, uh, the only prerequisite of this tutorial is that you need to have Git installed. So if you're on a Linux system, if you're on an RPM or Fedora-based system, you should be able to use DNF to install Git. If you're on an Ubuntu system or a variant, you can use apt-get. Um, there's information here for Windows users. There's something called Git for, you, for Windows. Um, and then Mac users can install it using brew. Right, so I'll wait two minutes so everybody can check that they have Git installed. You can see what version of Git you have installed using the Git version command. Okay, um, is there anybody who has um, who has trouble using Git at the moment? Otherwise, we can get cracking. Okay, so uh, assuming everybody has Git working now, so generally Git has it has two sides to it, right? It's got a local side and it's got a remote side. What that means is that you have a copy of the Git repository on your local system, but you will also have a remote. Now a remote is not necessary and we'll go into remotes later, but for the time being, we're just going to work locally on our systems and see what Git can do for us. So ideally um, see where you are. I'm in my home folder. Um, hopefully quite a few of you attended the command line session on bash earlier today. So the command line would be familiar to you. If you haven't, you can just copy the commands I'm running. So pwd tells you your present working directory. I'm in my home folder. I'm going to create a new folder, right? Called git tutorial. That's mkdir git tutorial. 
and I'll paste this in the chat for you. And then we're going to enter that folder using the CD command, right? Okay, so what we have at the moment is a, is a completely empty folder, right? There are no contents. We haven't added any files to it. Now, the first thing you do is you initialize a Git repository. So at the moment, Git doesn't know. So for example, if I try to run a command, Git will tell me that this doesn't look like a Git repository. So what you must do is you must initialize a Git repository, right? So um, what you'll notice luckily is that like other command, uh, other Linux commands, uh, Git uses a lot of mnemonics, which is which means that the commands intuitively tell you what the command is meant to do. So in the case of Git, for example, you'd run git init to initialize. Okay, and then you should see a message similar to my, it may not be identical if you're using a different version of Git. Okay. And now what you'll see is that if you run, let's say this command to look at all your hidden files and folders, right, we'll notice now that where the repository was blank, Git has created a .git folder for us. And this folder is where Git stores all its metadata, all the information about your repository, right? It is very rare for someone to have to modify this folder by hand, okay? You, we, we just use Git commands and they'll update the folder as required, okay? Okay, so now we have an empty Git repository. We still don't really have any useful files in there. We only have a Git folder that tells us that this is a Git repository. Okay, um, are we good so far? Has anybody had any trouble until now? You can ask me in the chat. Okay, we'll assume that to be all good. Now that we have, <coughs> oh, sorry. Now that we have a folder that is a Git folder, we can now start adding files to it, okay? So um, create a file in here. You can use whatever editor you want. I'm just going to use the echo command because I'm a bit lazy to open an editor. Okay. So what I've done is I've quickly create a new file. All right, if you run ls to look at the contents of your folder or if you open your file browser, you should now see this file in there. And we can then inspect this file using either cat or again, if you're using an editor, you can open your editor to have a look. You'll see that it has one line and that's the line that I put in there. Okay. Um, and now that we have a file in here, the file is not yet known to Git, all right? Yeah, sure, sorry about that. Uh, let's wait a minute or two. If I do go fast, please do ask me to slow down, thanks. Um, Zach, I'm not sure what you mean. How am I clearing the Git screen of text? So um, uh, if you mean my terminal, you generally do clear. At least that works on Linux, that should work on Macs. 
should work on Git for Windows, I hope. Uh, should certainly work on WSL if that's what you're using. Okay, sure. I'm sorry, it's a habit to clear my screen. I'll clear it less. Uh, but um, I will make sure all the commands also get documented in our shared document, right? So um, let me put the link of that back here. Because sometimes um, the output from commands will be quite long. It'll take the whole screen, so you won't be able to see what I've done before. So if you can have the shared document open, I think that would be quite useful. Okay. Okay. Um, no, so git bash is, um, so bash itself is a shell. Okay. So that's the command line, which has various features. And git bash is sort of a wrapper where they give you git and they give you some utilities that are included in bash. Okay. So for example, um, People on Linux and Mac will not use um, Git Bash. We just use Bat. Uh, we'll just use Bash, and we'll just install Git and use it there. But uh, yeah, for Windows, for example, um, I think you can use Git using the Windows command prompt. It may not be very nice, I don't think. So Git Bash is a package that people have come up with, which gives you common utilities in Bash, and it gives you Git. Yeah, uh, it is better to use Git Bash in Windows, yes. Um, some people may even be using um, the Windows subsyst subsystem for Linux, WSL, which basically gives you access to a Linux system from within Windows, but, uh, but you can use Git Bash, you're not required to use WSL. Okay, so um, everybody should by now have a new folder that has been initialized for Git using Git in it. And you should have created a really basic file in there with whatever text you want, that's up to you. Uh, and you should be able to inspect that file using your editor or using cat or less or more or any of these tools, okay? Um, Okay, if you, if you haven't done that, can you either raise your hand or drop a message in chat and I'll wait longer, otherwise I'll, uh, I'll go on. Okay, great. So now everybody has a file in there that they want to, um, they want Git to take care of for them. At the moment, Git doesn't know about this file, right? So you've got Git metadata, Git knows that this folder should be taken care of, that files in here should be looked at, but it doesn't know that this particular file is something it needs to store, okay? And you can look at this by running the git status command, right? And as the command says, it shows you the status of the current git folder. Okay. So you should get an output similar to what I get on my terminal. It should tell you that there are no commits yet. We'll come to a commit later, but it should tell you that there's an untracked file in your folder, right? And it should show you the file that you've just created. And now because Git is a helpful tool, it tells us what we should do to track this file, right? So it says use git add to track. So let's try doing that and see what happens. Okay, so the command is git add and the name of your file. Um, there's, there's a lot of advanced usage with add, which I'll show later, but for the time being, let's just add one file.
um, folks who know Git, if I skip anything, please feel free to point it out, okay? Because I do have a script, but I don't think it covers everything. Okay, we've now added Git, uh, we've added a file to the Git wrapper. We've told Git that we want this file to be tracked. Generally, once you add a file, you just check the status again. George, that's all right. That's um, primarily because uh, you're probably using a different OS and therefore Git is, so LF is kind of uh, the new line character at the end of the line and CRLF I think is what uh, it is on Windows. So you're probably using Windows or maybe Mac. So that's fine. That's, that's just Git telling you that uh, this particular character will be replaced by another one. Yeah, I thought so. So um, that's one aspect where Windows and Linux differ. Linux by default, um, the new line character is LF, that's line feed. Whereas on Windows, you have carriage return line feed, that is CRLF, okay? Okay, thanks for pointing that out. I've put that in our notes now. Okay, so everybody's told Git to track this file for us. Uh, you've all had a look at your status. Everything looks correct. Now at the moment, we've told Git that we wanted to track this file, okay? So let's see what happens if we change this file already, okay? This is very, very simple. So I'm going to do echo. Okay, note the use of double um, right chevrons, I guess they'd be called. What this does is that this appends to the file. Okay, so now my file has two lines. Okay. Again, you can use your text editor if you if you want. That's perfectly all right. Okay. All we want to do is add another line um, to this file. And now let's inspect. Let's see what Git has to say again. Okay. So what Git says is that you have tracked a file, readme.txt. When we told Git to track it, Git had stored the status of that file. Right. So Git knew that this file had one line and now we've added another line, but we haven't told Git what to do now after the file has changed, okay? So what Git is saying is that yes, I'm tracking your file, but I can see that your file has now changed, okay? And what it's asking us is, what do you want to do with this? Do you want to add this new change you've made to the file? Do you want me to take care of that? Or do you want to undo this change, right? And just stick to what you've asked me to, to track for you. Now you can already see the power of Git, right? So uh, let's say you've written your model, you've run it, everything works fine, and you've done Git add. Then if you go back and make some changes, you already know very clearly what has changed in that file because Git will track that for you. And with that, we come to a very, very useful command that is Git diff. Okay. So everybody should see an output of this form. So what Git is saying here is that A is the version that we had asked Git to track, B is the current version. And what Git's telling us is that there's a new line. So it'll delineate all new lines with a plus and any line that's been removed with a minus. I'll show you that again, right? So what it's saying at the moment is that there's a new line that has not been tracked yet, okay? So you've already got two versions of your file. The first version is what we added when we use git add with one line. 
that is referred to as the cached version. Okay, so this is the version of the file that you are preparing to save using Git. Okay, the other version is the unstaged version. Right, so this is a change you've made, but you've not asked Git to save this change yet. Okay. Ah, that tells you the line number. So Git tells you the context. Oops. Git tells you the context of this file. So what it's saying is that uh, around line one and between line one and two, something has changed. Okay. So when we go further and when we have much longer files, you'll see that this will indicate the line in your file where something has changed. Okay. An important thing to note here is that Git does its, uh, it stores changes based on line. Okay. So if we had only changed something in the first line itself, Git would treat that as a line being removed and a new, new line being added, okay? And this has some implications on how to use Git well. And, I, and we'll talk about that once our files get slightly longer, okay? Um, so. Okay, is everybody good so far? Does everybody have a diff that's showing a new line? If you do not, please drop a message in the chat. Okay, lovely. Um, does everybody have the commands? I sort of need to clear my screen, sorry. Okay, here it is. But I can show you these two again. All right. So until now we've initialized a repository, we've added a file, we added some information to the file and we asked Git to track that particular version, right? The terminology for that is you staged a version of your file. And so Git status tells you that there's this staged version and then there are some unstaged changes. And with git diff, you can see what these unstaged changes are. Okay. At the moment, let's leave this line alone. We don't want to do anything with it. Let's come to the next command. Okay, so git commit. Now what you're doing here is we're telling git that we staged a particular version of our file. Okay, the version that git knows about, the one line, the first line. And what we're telling git is we only want git to commit that particular version right now. Okay, so if you run git commit, okay, it'll open up a screen. Okay, so um, for most people, this will probably be uh, running vi, vi. Um, for some of you, it might run a different editor. Um, you can tell very quickly because um, if it is vi, if you, for example, press j or k, your mouse, uh, your line will move up or down. Okay, you will not be able to type. Okay, so that's, that's the default of my system. Your system might differ, it might be nano or it might be, uh, I hope it's not Emacs. Uh, it might even open up in, uh, in Atom or some other editor that you're using. If it is Y, press I to enter insert mode. Okay, I'm not going to go into why, that's a whole different tutorial, but if it is why, you'll see um, when you press I, it'll say insert at the bottom. Okay, and um, what this screen is doing is giving you the opportunity to write a commit message. Ah, okay. Uh, We'll pause here and just uh, answer Francesco's question. So if you're using Git for the first time, uh, it hasn't been configured. So for example, when you try to commit, Git needs to know a little bit about your uh, identity because when it does a commit, it stores your email. So if you do get uh, the message Francesca is getting, uh, just run what it asks you to run. So run git config global mail and whatever your email is. Right. 
Uh, this can all be edited later, so you don't have to use a genuine email if you don't want to. Uh, we will use GitHub in the second half of this tutorial. So uh, if you have an account on GitHub, try and use that same email. So your change history is stored in that Git folder that it creates, right? That's where it stores metadata. Uh, it's not stored as, it is plain text, but Git has its own format for changing for storing changes, okay? But yes, so all of this information goes in your, in the folder we created, right? So all your um, data files go there, all your source code files go there, and the Git metadata also goes there, okay? Okay, um, is everybody on the commit screen? Is everybody seeing something similar to my terminal, um, either in an editor or in Vim? Okay, so if you're in Vim, press I to enter insert mode. And then this is your opportunity to explain what you're doing, right? This is called a commit message. Um, and as we'll see later, commit messages are extremely important because when you have hundreds of commits, you want to quickly be able to look at your commit message to see what you may have changed. Okay, so it's all of us, for example, will keep research journals where we make notes on what we've done on a daily basis. Think of this as a journal. Okay, every change you make, each time you commit, you get this excellent opportunity to note down what you did. Okay, now the general format for a commit is that you give Okay, so you give a short one line summary. You should try and keep this short. You, uh, it should, generally you try and keep it fewer than 70 characters. Uh, that's not only because it's easier to go through when you're looking through lots of commits. It's also because when you use something like GitHub, you see a really short summary, okay? But after you've put in your short summary, you can write whatever you want. You can write a huge paragraph here explaining what you've changed. If it's for example, a new algorithm you've implemented, you can completely you know, detail the, the details, the algorithm, what's changed, what you're trying to do and so on and so forth. Um, a good rule of thumb for this one line summary is you write it such that it completes the sentence. If applied, this change will, okay? So for example, for this one, And let's make the caps. Okay, so if applied, this change will, or this commit will, because we want to use the right jargon. Okay. Um, if you're using Vim, you can either hit escape to leave insert mode, in which case, the insert at the bottom over here should disappear. Okay. And um, to quit from Vim, press capital Z twice. That's shift Z twice. Okay, I'll make a note here.
Um, while I'm noting this down, does anybody have any issues so far? Has everybody been able to commit? You should get this sort of output. Okay. But if um, if anybody has trouble with a commit, please drop a message in the chat and we'll have a look at that. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next bit. Okay, so now we've done a few things. We've told Git we want it to look after a folder for us. We've created a new file. We've staged um, a version of our file, right? So we've told Git what version of our file we wanted to store. And then we've commit, right? We've committed to this. We've now told Git, okay, this version is what I want you to store, okay? Um, we've looked at how to write commit messages. Um, we've looked at what good commit messages are. Uh, there, are there are more conventions for this. Zara, we, we told it that in general is going to look after the folder, right? So if something changes in the folder, it will point it out to you. But we explicitly told it to look, to track a particular version of the file. So think of it as you have a folder where you're working, but there's a snapshot at a moment in time that you want to store. And that's what we did when we did git add and git commit. We've now made git store a snapshot, a moment in time of that folder, right? And that takes us to the next command. So now that we've got a commit, you can look at okay. So now there are, there are a few things to see in this commit message. Okay. First of all, observe that it stores who wrote this commit message, right? So there's an author field over there. This is important, um, even more important when uh, you start to work collaboratively. So let's say you have a GitHub repository and you've got lots of people committing, uh, adding code and so on. You want to easily be able to look at who wrote a small piece of code or who made a particular change, right? And if you go onto GitHub, and we'll see this in the second part, the list of contributors, for example, is also generated from this piece of information, all right? So it notes down who wrote this, who made this commit, so who asked Git to, snow, to store this particular snapshot in time. It will store when this was done. So it's showing this in my local time because I am one hour ahead of uh, Greenwich Mean Time or UTC, whichever you prefer. So it's 6.30 p.m. over here on June 28th, Monday. And then it shows you your commit message, all right? It, it will show you whatever you've written down, okay? This is all the information that we sort of input. The next bit to look at is this, the first line. It says commit and it's got a few symbols, well, numbers and alphabets. This is called the commit hash. Okay, so for each uh, change, each snapshot that you make git save, what it does is that it calculates a hash. Okay, we don't need to go into how it does that. It, it, it uses, I think, SHA, uh, I think it's still SHA 128 or 256, I'm not sure. But for each commit, as we go on, you'll see that this is unique. Okay, so this is. If you think of it, this is the identity of your commit. 
if you know the commit hash, you will be able to find your commit, okay? And so now we've looked at author, date, we've looked at the git log that we wrote in, we've looked at the commit hash, okay? And now it also shows you something called head and main, right? Ignore this for the time being. I'll, I'll explain what both of these mean later. Okay. So. Um, just a moment, I'm answering a few queries. Okay, is, um, does everybody have a git log? Can everybody see the message they had written when they were making that commit? If not, uh, drop, please drop us a message in the chat. Okay, um, I'm going to clear my screen, sorry. You can ignore the tags file, that's just on my system you won't see it. Now, so git log shows you a quite detailed log. You can also do, okay, so there are lots of other options that you can do. Right, so for example, if you do git log one line, it will only show you the one line, the first line of the commit, that's why this becomes important, okay. It's not immediately clear now because we only have the one commit, but um, um, I will make us clone a, quite a huge repository and then you'll be able to see um, how useful it is. Okay. So far, so good. So now if you run git status, you'll see that the output has changed slightly. Git no longer tells us that there's a stage file that has not yet been committed. All it tells us is that there's some change to this file that we haven't asked it to track yet. Okay. Um, the most common thing to do is to see what um, had changed in the file. Uh, then we decide if we want to store this file. So let's do that again. So we do git add, read me again, git commit, we'll add another Okay, I'm just going to leave that quite short. Okay, um, if you are in Vim, remember you press I to go into insert mode, then you write whatever you want to, and then you press escape to leave insert mode and capital Z twice to save the file. Okay, maybe later we can have a look at how to change that for people that aren't uh, Vim. Uh, I'll note that down here somewhere.
Okay. Uh, we can run git log again. Uh, yeah, we intend to make the recording available, yes. Okay, now if you run git log again, now you'll see that we have two commits. The second commit will be very similar. Observe that it has a unique git hash, very different from the first one. Observe that the author is the same because I have written both these commits. In your case, it should show you as the author of both of these commits. It'll show you the date when this was made and it shows you the commit message, okay? Uh, if some, if anybody is having issues with the second commit, please let us know in the chat. And now, um, if you try git log one line again, thanks, Joe. I'll also make a note of that. Um, question, um, it does Git for Windows have nano though, Joe? Uh, that I don't know. I, I run a uh, Mac. <laughs> yeah. So I guess if you're on a Mac or Linux, you should have nano installed. It's, it's not an editor, but it's quite simple to use. I'm not sh really sure what editor Git for Windows has, unfortunately. Okay, um, so everybody has a second commit now and they understand what the commit shows us. Everybody should have run git log one line to quickly see the two commits. Okay. Um, Another bit worth observing is that the output of git log one line does show you your git hash, but it shows only the first six or seven uh, alphabets of your git hash, right? So if you look at the full commit log using git log, you see five C all the way to left over here, but git log one line shows you a shortened form, right? It's still enough to, uh, still enough to know the identity of your git log, uh, of your git commit, okay? So for both of these, Git log is so uh, git log one line is a very is a short way of seeing your commit history. Okay. Right. Uh, I'm going to clear again. I hope everybody has this noted down. Okay. So you'll see that um, there are certain things I do without thinking. So, for example, I clear my screen without thinking. I generally run ls to see what's in my folder when I clear my screen. I generally end up doing git status just to see what's the status of my Git repo, these things sort of become habit because these are uh, very, very common commands that you end up using quite a bit, okay? Uh, if I run git diff now, I get no output because everything that we've asked git to track has been committed, all right? Okay. Now, so now we know how to initialize the repository. We know how to add a file to it. We know how to get git to store files. Uh, we know the difference between staging a file and committing a file, right? Staging means think of it as you're preparing to commit it, okay? So commit happens in two steps. First you stage your file and then you commit it, okay? Um, let's now, uh, let's create another file, okay? So, Okay, as usual, run a git status. Git will tell you that there's a new file that I'm not aware of. Okay, git diff doesn't show you anything because git diff only shows you changes in files that are being tracked, okay? So I'm going to do git add to add this new file. 
Okay, I'll give you all a minute to add the new file. Git status will then tell you that yes, there's a new file that you want me to track, but it has not been committed yet. Okay, if you have any queries uh, in this set of commands, please drop a message in the chat. Okay. Now, when we do git diff, it still doesn't show us um, any output, but that's because we've staged this file. So Git knows that this is ready to now be committed, okay? If you want to see what has been staged, you give diff the catched option, All right? So if you try this, you'll get the same output that we got before from a plain git diff. The difference is that when git diff looks at what's changed in files you're already tracking, git diff cached shows you what has been staged, what is expected to be committed. All right, so Generally, when, I, um, when I'm working, I'll create a file or whatever, and I'll add it. But before I commit, I just want to be sure that I'm committing the right things. So I end up generally doing a git diff cached before I then do commit, OK? Um, now, because you're going to commit quite often, I'm going to show you a quick shortcut. So instead of only using git commit, that opens up a window for you to write your message in, you can also do this, right? Right, so the flag is minus M. And what it says is that whatever text follows this flag should be the commit message, okay? So if you're doing a quick commit where you don't want to open up your uh, editor to write a commit message, you should do this, okay? But note that um, it's much harder to then write a complete commit message if you're using the, minus, the dash M flag, right? So you generally only use this when you've made a tiny change and you don't really want to explain what you've done. You just want to add the top commit summary message. And now if you do this, you'll see three commits as expected. If you look at the full log, you'll see that the command, the information I had passed to git commit minus M will show up here. Okay, does that work for everyone? Minus N? And does everybody have a few commits now? If you don't, please drop a message and we'll take a look. Okay, um, we had the one R mark, so I think we should take a quick 10 minute break for everybody to get teas and coffees. And well, feel free to play around with this. Um, the, the good thing about Git is it's very hard to mess up. As you can see, it, you're storing every change you make and we'll show you how you can undo changes. You can pick changes, you can move them about. We'll show you all of that. So um, in this quick 10 minute break, um, I would strongly suggest you create new files. You add new lines to those files, add them do a git diff, look at what it shows you. Um, do a git diff, do a git diff ca uh, cached, uh, do a git status, and then add a few more commits, observe your commits using the git log command. Okay, basically have a quick revise uh, revision of what we've done so far. Okay, um, I guess I can set up a quick timer.
Okay, um, Joe Shalesh, you're saying five minutes, 10 minutes? Um, probably 10 minutes is yeah, nice. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we'll come back in um, 10 minutes. See you soon. Yeah, I'm going to go get some water because my, my uh, throat's already sore, unfortunately. See you guys in 10 minutes.
Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope everybody had a chance to get their teas and coffees and maybe stretch their legs a bit, um, especially if you are um, in Europe or before like me, where well, it's evening now. Uh, let's wait a minute or two just to let people come back and then we'll continue. In the meantime, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. So now everyone um, knows how to initialize a Git repository. We all know how to tell Git, how to track um, files. We know how to tell Git to stage a file, which is preparing for a commit. We know how to see what has changed in files using Git diff. Um, finally, we've seen how to commit a file. And then we've also seen how to go through our commit history and what different components of uh, the Git log contain, right? So they have a hash, they have the author date, and uh, you have a summary. Okay, so generally, um, if you're working alone on your own projects, uh, this is quite sufficient, right? Um, you, can, uh, you can write your code or you can write your journal. Um, that's the other thing. Git is not limited to source code files only, right? Um, you can actually even store word files, right? Um, you can store binary files. Git will just not do a very good job at figuring out what's changed, right? Because the binary file doesn't exactly have uh, different lines. But any text file, so uh, Python, Perl, C, C++, MATLAB, pretty much any coding language, because most coding languages use plain text files, Git can handle. Um, it can handle LaTeX if you use LaTeX like I do. Um, it can handle markdown, restructured text, uh, whatever flavor of markdown you want to use to uh, write on GitHub or so on and so forth. Um, it can even store plain text data files. So for example, uh, I sometimes commit um, outputs from my simulations to Git, right? That way um, I have the exact version of my code that was run. And along with that, I have the data that was produced, right? So, uh, it, I mean, it's very flexible. It's totally up to you how you want to use it. Uh, the basics we have just shown you. So we've shown you how to add files and commit files, right? This is quite sufficient for uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day Git usage, right? Um, we're now going to move, uh, I wouldn't say advanced, but we're now going to move to certain features that make it even nicer, right? So at the moment, we are only looking at it as sort of a journal of what we change in files. Now we're going to look at what more we can do with this journal, okay? So I'm going to clear my screen. I want you to now run something called git branch. Okay, we're going to introduce git branches. So again, if I start going, um, too quickly, please stop me. Okay, please just let me know in chat and I'll slow down. Um, so in my case, the output is name. Um, for some of you, it might say master, uh, if you're using an older version of Git. This, by, this is the default branch. And we'll speak about what branches are in a bit. So when you create a new Git uh, repository as we did with Git init, Git creates a default, think of it as a workspace. It creates a default workspace for you and it calls it main, right? And all of these, if you run git log one line, all of these commits belong to this branch called main, okay? And what head here does is it tells you what is the status of your folder right now. So what this is telling us is that head is at this particular commit, right? On branch main, okay? So I'll note that down.
Okay. Now let's say we want to create a new branch. Okay. So what you're doing is you're checking out a new branch minus B and let's just call it not main. Okay, the name is totally up to you. I'll, I'll discuss good practices for using for using branch names, but for the time being, just give it whatever you want. Okay. All right, let's have a look at our Git log again. What you see now is that we are this commit and head, which means the current status or the current snapshot that we are on is at main. And because not main is at the same place, we're also at not main, okay? Let's try something else. So I'll explain this command because you have to uh, tweak something here. We're doing git checkout minus V again. We're giving the name of the new branch, but at the end, you're also telling git what commit you want this branch to be at, okay? So I'm saying I want it to be at my first commit, the hash for which is 13C9DFD. For you, this hash will be different. So you must write git checkout minus b first commit. And over here, you must paste the commit hash for your first commit, right? My, my, the value shown here will not work for you. Yeah. There you go. I had a typo there, I had an extra b at the end, sorry. Okay, let's do the same thing. Let's do git log one line. Hmm, interesting. And let's look at what files we have here. Do you see, do you see something has changed? The second file we had created is no longer there. So what we've effectively done here is we've gone back in time. We've gone back to our first commit where we only had one file. And if you observe this file, you'll see that it's at that particular moment in time when we only had one sentence in it. Okay, I want everybody to give, I want everyone to give this a quick try and make sure they, they observe that this is what has happened here. If you have any issues with this set of commands, uh, please uh, ask a query in the chat. Okay, everybody is able to um, go back to their first commit. Everybody can verify that the file has gone back. Uh, Zara, you need to, so after git checkout minus b first commit, you do need to paste the hash of your first commit, right? So if you do git log one line, it should show you a bunch of commits you need to copy this value and paste it at the end of the command, like I've done over here.
Mm. That's very odd. Do you have three comets? Is it working for everybody else in the meantime? So git log one line should show a bunch. Um, uh, okay, I, I, I know what we've done. So we changed to the not main branch where there was only one commit. So okay, so um, do git checkout main everybody again to get back to your main branch, which has all your commits. Right, then do okay. So go back to the main branch that's git checkout main. It'll tell you that you've switched to this branch. Then look at the git log that's git log one line. Okay, now you should see all your commits. Okay, because in the main branch is where we made our three or four commits. It should show you all your commits. Then from there, do git checkout minus v, the name of your new branch, and then the oldest commit. So the commit that's last in this list. Okay, if you had already changed to the not main branch or something else, and you were only seeing one commit, then you wouldn't be able to select this particular commit, right? You need to select a different commit to where you are now. Okay. Is anybody else having uh, any issues with this uh, set of steps? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to branch, but we're trying to branch at a point back in time. We're not, we don't want to have a look at what the status of a folder is now. We want to have a look at what the state was when we made our first commit. Ah, oh, yeah, Zara, okay, that explains it, <laughs> great. Okay, does, does everybody have, um, have their branch at an older commit now? I'm saying use the first commit, but you can use the second one. George, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Um, so a branch exists. So if your branch is, for example, in this scenario, I'm just going to switch to main again. So if you're already at main and you create a new branch, it will have all the commits that main has, okay? So which is why not main also points to the last commit. What this means is that these two branches, main and not main, have all of these commits in them. Okay, so you read this output as, um, as, as uh, the a commit, uh, a branch here contains all the commits, it's called in jargon, you would call it a commit tree. And this is the latest node of your commit tree, okay? And now if you think about trees, then the second commit is a parent of the third commit, right? And therefore, similarly, 
the second commit is a pair is a descendant of the very first commit. So you think of it in terms of a tree, right? Okay. Um, you can quickly look at all your branches using git branch. Um, if you run git log, it will show you all your branches over there. All right now you can see the difference. You can see that head is at the latest two branches, right? Main and not main. Whereas we've created two commits at the first commit. Um, you can switch between branches really easily. So for example, observe that we have two files here. But if I do um, this, I only have one file, right? So, you, so Git is taking care of the folder and it's, it's helping you go back in time, all right? Now, um, until now, we we have a Git tree because we have three commits. We've got three nodes, but we've only got, it's very linear, right? So each commit is a parent of the other. So I want you all to go back to the first commit Okay, where you only have the one file. And now let's create another file. Right. Okay, so now we have, at this point, we have two files, right? We're right at the bottom of our commit tree, right, at the first commit. And let's see what happens if we add okay so i'll wait for everybody to do this i want you to create a new file with a different name i want you to add a line to it i want you to tell git to track it using the git add command i want you to tell git to commit these changes using the git commit command. And you can use the, the minus M flag to quickly add a commit message. Okay, I'll wait two minutes until everybody's done. Um, but you're, what you'll notice here is that uh, there are a few commands that you use very, very often, right? So you use add, commit, diff, log. These are very, very commonly used commands. You'll use them multiple times a day. Uh, and generally you'll use them in sets. So you'll generally use um, diff, then you'll look at the status, then you'll add a file using git add. Then you might want to look at the status again before you could, before you commit, and then you'd use the commit. So there's, it's kind of a cycle. You commit, so that means you've saved your work stage, uh, then you make more changes, then you commit again, and so on, right? So now we've got two files over here. I'll wait another minute or two for everybody to do this. Um, Okay, once you've done that, do the same thing. Have a look at your log. So either one line or the whole log, if you want to see. You can also try something else. Right, you can also tell git log uh, what branch you want to see the log for. So I've just said git log main. Um, right, so, it, so you, you're not limited to the log of the branch that you're on. You can see any anything in the git history. Okay. So what we've done now is, let's go back to main. 
and have a look at this. Observe how the first commit does not show here because it's not really part of this tree. All right, so what we've done is we've created a new branch. Okay, so this particular branch, if you think of it as a tree, the first commit is the common parent of these two branches, but they're two distinct branches that do not overlap. On one branch, we've got these three commits, right? So all the way from new branch back in time to main and not main. And on the other branch, we've got first commit, right? They've, in Git jargon, you'd say that these two branches have now diverged, right? And I believe, and now if you add the all flag, it'll show you the it'll show you the complete tree, but it'll show you in a straight line. So it's showing you that we have a branch at the very first commit. We have these two, main and not main, on one branch where head currently is because we're on main, but it will also show you the other commit where we've diverged to, to the different branch. Now let's introduce another option. Let's ask git log to show us a graph. Okay, so I'm going to put all of these in the chat for you. So if you did create a file in your new branch and add a commit, you, you can now look at the git commit tree, right? So what we can see here is that the first commit is the common ancestor, but we have two distinct branches. On the right, you've got a branch that ends in main and not main, that's the branch with two commits. This is what we were working on before. What you'll see now is that you have a different branch on the left. It could be on the right and yours, depends on uh, the version of Git you're using. And you can see that we now have a different branch, right? But the parent of this branch is still the first commit, right? So we're no longer working linearly. Let's say for example, um, the first commit could be your model, right? So a version of your model that works, a, a version of your analysis code that works. And now you want to, test out, let's say, two different sets of parameters. The easiest way here is create two branches, one for each parameter set, and run them, right? So that way you know where they both come from, you know where the parent is. But at the same time, you can easily have two different branches which have two, log two different logical meanings, right? So one may be to test parameter A, and the other could be to test parameter B. And the very, very good thing about Git is that branching is cheap. You can create as many branches as you want and Git will be perfectly all right. Because all Git really does is it already stores all of this commit information. All it really does is it stores some extra information to say, my branch points to this Git commit, all right? So branching is very cheap. Uh, you generally don't have to think twice about creating a new branch, just go for it, it's totally all right, okay? Any questions so far? Has everybody managed to diverge their Git tree so that they have two completely different branches that they can look at? If you haven't uh, reached here or if you have any questions, please ask, we'll wait. Uh, but that's sort of why we've given this three hours, right? So if you do have queries, we'll clarify your queries before moving on.
Okay, is everybody good so far? Although if you are, I'm going to clear my screen. So if you're not, please let me know. Right, uh, clearing my screen now. So this is a very, very useful command that I can paste for you. Okay. So we are currently on the main branch. If I leave out uh, the all flag, it'll only show me the history of this particular branch. Now, sometimes you want to quickly go over and see what you change in your commits. So for that, you use the minus P flag, okay? And now what you can see is um, not only is it showing you the commit, it's also showing you the diff. So it's showing you what changed in this commit, right? So for example, this is the first one here. And what it's showing is that we added a new file here called read more, right? So uh, this means that it removed dev null, which um, in Linux is symbolic for nothing might be slightly different on your machine. And it plus, plus, plus means it added this file, right? So it removed nothing but added this file. And it shows you the line number at which this was added. It's, it's a very standard uh, diff output, all right? But it's just showing you the diff for every commit. And it's showing you the line we added. And because it's an addition, it's showing a plus symbol over here, right? Similarly, then it's showing you the next commit where we added another line in the file, right? Now you see that because we've, um, the change was made, something was, uh, what it's trying to say is that uh, we moved, we removed readme.txt but version A, and we added readme.txt but version B. And the difference between version A and version B of the file is that we've added a new line called hello, that says hello again, right? So that's what the plus is for. And now this is showing you in what is referred to as a pager. So if you press any key, it'll scroll down, right? So for example, I hit spacebar, I came down to the last entry in the commit. And this, again, this is the first commit that we had done. So it goes backwards. It goes from the current commit backwards up the tree, right? To the root node, to the ancestor. Um, if you want to get out of this pager, press Q. Okay, so uh, if your system like mine is using less as the pager, it'll show you an end over here. Press Q to get out and come back to your uh, terminal. All right, so everybody has done git log one line graph. Ah, oh, I'd already pasted there, okay. Any questions so far? So we know how to add files, we know how to see what's changed when we're staging. We know how to see what, has, what, what had changed when we had made a commit. Okay, so this is just showing you how to go backwards and forwards in your, um, in the git commit tree, right? We've also seen how to make branches. Uh, in fact, we've made two distinct branches, right? Okay, so, um,
All right, so let's have a look at our tree again. This is what we get. Um, I want to go back and work on the first commit branch. So I'll do git commit, uh, git checkout, right? Um, this time, instead of adding a new file, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to add another line. Okay, so this is the normal workflow. I've made a change to a file. I'm not looking at what I changed. I can see that I've added another line to this file. I can see that um, this file is known to Git because we have tracked this in the past, but there are currently some changes that we haven't asked Git to store. So I can do the usual thing. I can do git add and I can do And then if I run my git log line again, right now you can see that I am working on the first commit branch. I now have another commit over here, my head, which means my, the current status of my repository is here. Okay, so far so good is, um, is everybody uh, relatively clear on the general Git workflow, how you add files, how you commit files, how can, you can use branches. Okay, if there are any questions, please ask them in the chat. Um, we're going to start moving to um, GitHub slowly. So you need to be clear uh, about all of these commands so far, right? So we've only been working locally. So at the moment, you don't really need an internet connection. Everything you're doing is on your machine. You're not sharing it with anyone. You're not storing it on a remote, right? At the moment, all we're doing is working locally. Okay. Um, right. Um, okay, so um, Zara's asked a question, how do you revert to an old version? Um, generally, you don't want to, um, you don't want to destroy your work. So we don't, we almost never think about deleting a commit. To revert to an old version, all you really just have to do is create a new branch at an older commit, all right? So if you do git checkout minus b, uh, your branch name at this commit, you will basically end up here, right? So that is the best way of going back and working on something before, something that you had done before. But as you'll note here, when you do go back and make changes, you're no longer part of the same branch because you diverge, right? Because this commit here, when applied to this particular commit here, so the one starting with four and when one starting with five here, it can only have one result. If you go back to five and make some other change, right, that will diverge further. So you'll then have three distinct trees over here. In fact, let me quickly show you that. Um, so git checkout minus B. Um, I'm just going to call it yet another branch in the past. Right. And okay, that's from a command. So now you've got your parent, which was the first commit. We've got the second branch that we were tinkering with. We've got the third branch. And now I've branched off at this commit to create yet another branch in the past. So if I do Right, I'm making a change. Take a look. I'm making a change to README. I'm going to do git add README. Right. And now let's look at our git log again. So what you can see here is they all have the common ancestor, which we haven't touched. 
the first commit, then there's one branch that has branched off from this commit. So the ancestor for the first commit branch for this is the first commit. Then we worked on in a straight line for a bit where we did add another file. But then from there, where we only had one branch going forward, we diverged again. So we've got the not main and we've got this, right? So this change is based on work you did in the past, right? But these two branches have now diverged because they're no longer, uh, they no longer have the same parent. Okay, is that clear? So you can go back to any commit you wish and continue from there, okay? That doesn't mean you should, okay? Uh, there's certain use cases where this is required, but generally it's good to sort of try and stay in a straight line. Um, I guess what we can show you now is how to merge. Uh, so everybody understands the divergence bit. Everybody understands why we have the root node here, the one parent, grandparent or whatever. I don't know how many children it has, how, how many descendants it has. But now you've got three branches here because you diverge at different points in your commit tree. Okay. Um, so we've got this. Um, uh, I guess the other thing to know is let's say that we have, so let's say that main is where we do most of our work, all right? So I'm going to check out and get to main, all right? Notice that head now has come to main over here. And now let's say I want to run a parameter search. So I will do B, right? And let's say parameter one. If you look at your log, you'll now see that I've created a new branch, but because I didn't tell it what branch to explicitly or what commit to work on, it did it just branched off main, right? And now um, what files do we have? So we have read more. Um, Okay, so I've just added another line. Uh, I'm modeling, let's say, where you've used a particular parameter in your, in your simulation or your analysis. Okay, so I'm going to add commit. All right, if you do a log, you can now see that, so from main, You've now got another branch called parameter one, which has one commit. So this, the main branch is my parent to parameter one. Okay, but let's say I want to also test out another parameter at main. So I'll do git parameter two, but this time I will say that I want it to branch off main, all right? So now if you have a look, again, You've got your head, which is where we are now, pointing to main. And I've created a new branch at main called parameter two. Now let's say in parameter two, I want to edit the other file. And you can even have edited the same file, it doesn't matter. All right. So I've added a line there, I'm going to add. Notice how the same commands get repeated again and again. Right. So now if you look at log, you'll see that this is where I was. This is, let's say, uh, the version of your analysis code or your source code or your journal or whatever that you like. You tried out two things over here. And let's say one of them worked. So let's say parameter one worked. Uh, sorry, parameter one worked. Now, what I want to do is I want to merge the changes from parameter one, which worked for me, into my main, right? Into my main branch. So what I effectively want to do is I want to move main to point to this commit, right? And what Git lets you do is it lets you merge different branches. So I will check out main. 
Okay, I'm back to main. And then I'll tell, I'll say to Git, look, that branch needs to be merged into me now. I want whatever changes were on parameter one to be applied to my main branch. And because Git loves mnemonics, you literally say merge and then, right? So I'm telling Git that whatever was done in the parameter one branch is correct. And I want to merge those changes, apply all of those changes to, the, to my main branch. Okay, so if you try this, you'll get something of this sort. And of course, let's look at the git log again. And what you notice now is that main has turned up where parameter one was. So we've successfully merged this particular branch into main, bringing main up from here to here. Any questions? I think I may have gone a bit quickly there. Is the merging procedure clear to people? I'll explain that again. So main was at this point where we had added a new file. At this point, I was happy with my code, but now I wanted to try out two features. Okay, two parameters. So I went ahead and created two branches. I created parameter one and I created parameter two. Now I did things in parameter one. I've made changes to my files, um, changes to parameters, changes to, well, any changes really that you want to make. Right. And then uh, I made some other changes to parameter two. Okay. And then after I've tinkered with all of this, I've seen, okay, fine. What I, what I did in parameter one looks good. I want to merge that into my main working branch. To do that, I tell, I first change to the main branch and I tell Git in my, in, where I am now in main, please merge parameter one. Okay. And this is why merging uh, branching is so cheap in Git because Git already has this commit. All Git really does is it takes main from here where it was with not main and it merges it. It just makes it point to parameter one. Right? That's, that's really all Git is doing. It's just updating its metadata to say main now points to wherever parameter one was pointing. Okay. Um, I'll wait two minutes. Uh, in fact, I think it's, uh, yeah, let's wait two minutes. I want everybody to please try this out to see for yourself how it works. Um, again, you'll notice how the primary commands that we've gone through are ones that repeat themselves again and again. Add, status, diff, commit, log, right? So these are pretty much your bread and butter on a daily basis. Merging is slightly advanced. Merging is, you don't have to, but as you see here, it, it leaves your code very well organized, right? So you know, now you can continue working on main, but you know when you had worked on parameter one and you don't really have to remove the parameter two branch, right? Why should you? You can leave it there. And if later sometime you want to have a look at it and you want to see what didn't work, you can always come back to parameter two and have a look, right? So it's storing the complete history of everything that you've done uh, in this particular folder with these files. Okay, I'll wait two minutes. If you have any questions, please ask, because I'm going to start, uh, we're going to go onto GitHub now. And these are things that you should understand well enough before uh, we do some GitHub work. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to, to make a pull request. And what a pull request does is pretty much this. Okay, so we are all going to get onto a GitHub repository and we are going to make, change some files and we're going to try and merge them and so on. But for that, you need to be quite clear on this on all of these commands. So if you have any um, uh, queries related to init, add, uh, diff, log, commit, branch, checkout, or merge, please ask. So Zara has asked, if we have multiple files in a folder, we would have a separate tree for all files or individual trees. That's totally up to you. Git doesn't really care about the file structure. It really only cares about uh, the changes that you ask it to, to track. 
So you could have a tree where you change different files, but you could even change the same files. Git will only store the changes, right? So, so Git really doesn't care about your, your folder structure or your file structure at all. Um, I'll, um, so we're looking at a very simple repository. Maybe I'll give you all a quick, um, a quick look at a more advanced repository where you can see how this kind of thing works. Okay. But yeah, so the takeaway is Git doesn't care about your, your folder structure. You need to tell Git which files or folders you want it to track. You, want, you have to tell Git which files, rather what changes you want it to A, stage, and after staging B, commit, okay? So as an example, I'm back on main, uh, but let's, right, so I'm going to add this to read me, but I'll also add this to read me more. So now Git will tell me that both of these files have changed. Your status will show you that both of these files have changed. I can add them individually and I can commit now or if the change, so, the, so the, the rule of thumb when making a commit is commit changes that are logically together, right? So you may have made changes to 10 files, but if all of those 10 files have related changes, let's say you've made a note, you've updated a bug, you added a feature, then put them in one commit, right? Because later it allows you to easily go through your changes. It allows you to easily cherry pick changes. I'll show you that later. So write good commit messages and try and uh, group sets of logical changes together into small commits. Um, the other rule is commit early and commit often. The smaller your commit is, the more control over, you, over moving about in a tree, right? So for example, if all of these changes were one big commit, I couldn't move about, I couldn't branch out from a previous commit. But if I break my commits down into the smallest atomic units, then I can effectively go back to any change and then make further tweaks from there, right? So let's note that down. Okay, the smaller your commits, the more control you, you, over your tree, right? So, okay, but I've done, I've, so I've done this and I'm going to do, okay, and now two files have changed in a comment. So it, it well, doesn't really care. It's totally up to, up to us to decide what changes should be part of a commit, right? Um, Any more questions before we um, move on to GitHub? Okay, so um, we're now going to go to github.com. Uh, this is my profile page, yours will obviously look different. Uh, I'm going to maximize this for a minute. Okay. Um, if you do not have a GitHub account, I'll wait two minutes for you to sign in. So open github.com, right? And there'll be a button somewhere that says, create an account or log in or sign in. Uh, please sign in. If anybody has trouble signing into GitHub, please let us know. Okay, once you've signed in, you should come to a page that looks a bit like this. Um, it'll look different because the entries, of course, will be different, but you should see a plus sign on the right-hand top corner. And there I want you to click new repository. 
Okay. Um, I'm also using a dark theme. Your GitHub might have a white background. It doesn't really make a difference. But I want you to click new repository. And then it should take you to a page like this. Okay, I'll wait a minute. Um, if anybody has any issues getting to this particular page on GitHub, please let us know. Okay, um, if everybody is on this create new repository page, you need to be signed into GitHub. Let's give it a repository name. So for the time being, I'm going to say 2021 to the 6th of June. You can give it whatever name you want. This is totally up to you. Uh, a good habit is to try and pick a unique name because you might have quite a few Git repositories later. So it's easy to find. Uh, something that fits the project you're working on. Um, if you're developing software, try and find a unique name so that when people search for it on either GitHub or Dr. Go or your favorite search engine, they can find it easily. For the time being, I'm just going to say year, month, day, Git tutorial. And my description is Okay. Now, um, GitHub gives you two options. You can have a private repository, so only you have access to, the report to this repository, or you can make a public repository. Um, uh, today, I would like everybody to please make public repositories. Um, please only make private repositories if you really have to. Uh, as, as members of the software working group, we really believe in open science. So try and make all your work and all your code public as much as possible, at least. Um, so we add a name to the repository, we add a description. Um, we're going to leave this repository as a public repository. We don't need to add any of this today. Once we've done all of this, click on create repository and then it'll bring you to a different page, something like this. All right. Okay, if anybody has um, has not reached this page, please let us know. So now luckily GitHub is quite user-friendly and you can see that um, it, it pretty much gives you instructions on what to do next. So at the moment we have, we have we've already created a repository on the command line, so we don't need to follow this section. This is what we want to do today, right? So we have an existing repository. We want to push an existing repository to GitHub, right? And the push and pull terminology will become clear as you go. So I want you to copy the first line. It, it will look different to what I have here, okay? Your, your URL will be different. It might not say git at github.com over here. It, it might say HTTPS or something of the sort but I want you to copy that line and I want you to paste it in the terminal where we were using Git locally. Okay, copy that first line and paste it where we were using Git locally. It won't say anything, hit enter, it won't say anything. Okay. But let's look at this command that we've just run. So until now we were working locally. This command says git remote add and origin. So what we're telling git now is that locally all the work is on our computers. We want to add a remote. A remote is a copy of a repository that's not on your machine. Okay, that's all it is. Um, in this case, we're using github.com. So our remote will be on GitHub. So you're doing git remote add, add a new remote called origin. 
and the URL. So where is my remote? It's at this uh, address, okay? So once you've run that, you can now run a command called git remote and it will show you that you have one remote called origin because that is the name that we had given it, right? We have given set origin over here. If you want more information on this remote, you can do git remote minus V. Minus V is generally a flag for verbose, which means give me more information. And when you do minus V, it shows you origin. It shows you what address Git is going to fetch from. We'll see that in a minute. And it's going to tell you what address for origin it's going to push to, okay? So you've got your local repository on your workstation, on your laptop. You now want to push it to a remote. This could be either, for example, to share with a colleague, right? Somebody else has a GitHub account, or it could just be to have a backup, right? So if something happens to your computer, you continue to have a copy of your repository on GitHub, okay? And now that you've added your remote, you can do git push. So we're going to push the local repository to the remote, All right? So git, git push origin, which is the name of the remote. So what remote we want to push to and what branch we want to push to, right? So we want to push our main branch to the remote named origin, okay? So in my case, because I use um, SSH keys, it will just do that. In your case, it might ask you to enter your GitHub username and password. If you have trouble with this step, please uh, drop a message in the chat and we'll have a look. Sometimes you have trouble here because the email that you may have set on your machine may not match GitHub. So GitHub might say that you're not the same person, for example. But generally, um, as long as you know your GitHub username and password, it should work fine. But if you have any trouble with this step, please let us know. Okay, so um, right, I I think that is because your username is different. So um, let me have a quick look at how to set the username. So generally you need to make sure that the username you've used on GitHub uh, is the same that you've set for Git over here. So try running git config global user.email. Um, see that this matches whatever email you've used to register on GitHub. Otherwise you might need to go into your settings and add this email. Okay, so go to settings, profile, um, emails. And then you will be able to add, well, pretty much as many emails as you use. Okay, so try and match that. Um, if that doesn't work, then we will, the other thing we're trying is to use HTTPS on top over here, not SSH. So SSH generally works for people who have uploaded something called an SSH key. And this lets you work with GitHub without having to use your username password each time. But if you don't have an SSH key, you should use HTTPS. So uh, that's a good opportunity to show us how to modify your remote. So we've got git remote minus V, right? So you've got origin, which points to here. And if I want to change it to HTTPS, I will copy this URL, the HTTPS URL, and I'll go git remote set URL, name of my remote, this origin, and then the URL. Okay, so we're telling Git that for this particular remote uh, called origin, I want to set the URL to this particular value. Uh, 
Uh, Zach, did it did it work for you finally? Are you still getting? Are you still blinking? The cursor. Ah, uh, right. Try and check if your username matches what you've put on uh, on uh, GitHub. Try that to start with. Uh, in the meantime, I'll quickly have a look to make sure that there are no other settings that you required to set. So George, um, I don't think the name has to match, but I think the email has to match because GitHub might use that uh, as a way to authenticate you. But I'm, I'm just looking at GitHub docs in case there's a different way of um, providing a username. I think there is, I'm just going to have a look. Uh, Zara, no, um, uh, your complete Git tree will still be um, pushed. Okay, I, I know upload is the general term, but in terms of Git, you can still push all your changes, okay? Uh, let's see. So here's a bit of documentation from GitHub on setting your email address. Uh, it also includes information on how to set it uh, on your local machine. So the easiest way is to go git config Zach, are you using uh, the SSH URL or the HTTPS URL? Right, and that should generally work. Um, can you also uh, update your name and see if that helps?
Yeah, so I, all I can find on GitHub's documentation is that your username should be um, set correctly and that should pretty much do it. Um, otherwise we can we can troubleshoot this later, I guess. Okay. Um, let's take a quick five minute break while everybody tries to push to that remote. Um, and we'll come back in five minutes and finish off the GitHub section of this talk. In the meantime, if you have uh, other questions or queries, put them in the chat and I can answer them. Ah, oh, Zara, okay. Um, it's still up in the chat somewhere, so you can still undo it if you wish. Yeah. If you look at our chat, Zara, you should find it there, but you should also be able to find it on GitHub. Yeah, sorry, I've had a GitHub account for so long, I've kind of forgotten how you start out with it. Okay, anyway, uh, we'll be back in, let's say five minutes. I'll set a quick timer on just to give everybody a chance to uh, take a quick break. Uh, Zach, try control C. Zach, uh, you can try using the, the minus V flag with your uh, push command also. Maybe it'll show some errors there that'll help us debug this. Okay, we'll be back in about four minutes. Please try and um, push to GitHub and let me know if it works, so it doesn't work. In the meantime, we've got a really short feedback form for you. Um, it's just got three questions in there about um, what else you could, what else you could, uh, what we could do in the session to make it more useful. Okay, I'm going to share the link with you here. Okay, Zach, so that, that seems to indicate that there's, um, so it doesn't have access to your repository. Can you, um, are you able to log into GitHub? Is all of that all right? Okay, were you able to create your repository and so on? Okay, that's a bit odd. And, um, have a look at your um, account settings on GitHub. Just make sure that your email and things over there match. And then HTTPS should really work unless there's something wonky going on. Um, um, also, what platform are you on, Zach? Are you on um, Git for Windows or something of the sort? Right, okay. That should be okay. We, we haven't had issues with Git for Windows until now. It, it generally happens to, it generally occurs when um, GitHub is unable to, for example, verify if the username you're using is the same as your account and, and so on and so forth. So that would be the first thing to check. But if that's all correct, then we'll have to debug this. Okay, I'm just going to go make myself another cup of tea. I'll be back in two minutes.
Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to proceed here, but Zach, you can continue debugging with Shailesh perhaps, okay? Okay, so um, once you set up your remote, so git remote minus V should show you this, and you should have been able to do git push origin main. Right, so the, the minus U is uh, optional. You can just do git push origin main, right? If you try it again, after you've already pushed, it'll show you that everything's up to date. Then if you go to your GitHub repository that you just created and refresh the page, you should now see that your files have turned up. Okay, so I'll full screen this just to show you this properly. So you can now see that you've got your main branch over here, right? There's only one branch for the time being, okay? If you click on commits, you will be able to see all the commits in this branch. Okay, observe how the summary, the short summary that you gave the first line, that turns up as the line here. This is why it's important to have a good short summary because when you're looking through lots of commits, that is what will show up here, okay? If you click on one of these, for example here, then it will show you the complete change log, right? So it will show you the complete message over here. I didn't add anything else over here, but it will show you what's changed in this file, right? So the two ways of looking at it, if you want to look at it the way we see it on the terminal, you click on unified. If you want to look at it as side by side, so the left is the previous version and the right is the new version of the file, okay? So GitHub is effectively a web-based app that, that does basically what you've been doing on the command line, okay? So if you go back to code, okay, over here you've got your two, two files. You can click and see these files. You can look at the history of these files, all right? Now, um, so until now, if you look at, go to code, go to branches, there's only the one branch because we've only pushed the one branch. Now try this, kiss push origin all. And it should give you an output of this form. So what it's telling you, well, what we asked it to do was to push everything from the tree to GitHub. And then Git will show you something of this sort. So it'll tell you that I've created a new branch for first commit, a new branch for this one, this one, this one, this one. And then if you refresh your GitHub page, all of these branches are also now on your remote that you're viewing through GitHub, right? Okay, let me quickly make a note of this. All right, so now we have all our branches. If you look at code now, it will tell you that you've got all of these multiple branches that have just been updated. If you go to your commits, you can change to whichever branch you want to look at its commit history. So 
under the hood, GitHub is running git log for your branch. That's basically what it's doing. Okay. Um, it also has some nice features. For example, you should be able to look at your um, commit tree. So um, let me quickly have a look. I think it should be here. All right. Uh, okay, so if you go to insights and commits, it'll generate a similar, well, that doesn't quite look right, but um, it used to have a page where it showed you the commit tree the way we've been looking at. Uh, there you go. If you look at network, then the graph that we've been seeing in our terminal, you can see that on GitHub over here. Right, so you can see your different branches. You can see how the branches have diverged into, into one, two, three, four different branches now, All right? And now um, if you go back to code, make sure you're on main, open one of your files. So let's say I'm going to open readme.txt and GitHub also allows you to edit these files. So let's edit this file. Okay, and I'm going to add a line here that says, and then it's pretty much the same. So this is a short comic summary for which I'm going to say, All right? And it says commit to the main branch. So the, the, edit add commit cycle that we had done on the terminal. I'm just doing that on GitHub. Okay, and now you can see that there's a new commit here. So if you go back to code and you go back to commits, you can now see that this commit has been added to our commit tree for the main branch. Right. Now, Now, what we want to do is we want to, so we made a change or somebody else made a change. It could have been a colleague or a collaborator or a friend um, who works on the same project. You can now in your terminal write git pull. Okay, and it should show you something of this sort. What it's telling you is that I don't know where to pull it to. So do git pull origin and main. So in a way where you told git that you want to push the main branch to origin, now we're doing the opposite from the remote on GitHub. We're running git pull origin main to pull it to our local copy of the repository. And when you do that, it'll give you this message, which says I've updated the branch main from this commit, the oldest commit that I had locally onto the new one, right? Okay, and now if I look at my log here, so let's do git log one line, summary, graph. You can see that the commit I had added using GitHub on my remote has now been pulled to my local repository. Okay, so we know how to push changes from our repository to the remote. At the same time, we know how to pull changes from the remote to our repository. Right. So the general way is, um, I mean, you can use GitHub to modify file, but it's not as um, easy to do. So the general way of really doing it is to make whatever changes you want, then push to your repository. Um, this also means that you can use different machines. So for example, uh, when I'm at home, I use, um, when I'm at home, I use um, my workstation but when I go to the office, I can just do a git pull from there because I've been pushing it from home. All 
All right, so we now know how to add files. We know how to look at files. We know how to uh, see what's changed. We also know how to stage a file. We know how to commit a file. We know how to now create a remote on GitHub. And we know how to push to the remote from our local repository. And we know how to do uh, the opposite. We know how to pull from GitHub to the local repository, right? Um, did that work for everybody? Was everybody able to push and pull? Um, apart from the few that are having issues uh, pushing to GitHub? If all of this works for you, we're going to do one final task where you're going to collaborate with me on my repository. Okay. So for this final task, we're going to go to Okay, I want everybody to please open this URL that I've put in the chat. This is our repository for uh, that includes information on things we do for the software working group. All right, so I want you to go to this repository. And what you're going to now do is you're going to fork this repository. So this repository is managed by us, by Shellish, Joe, me, and other members of the software working group. You can have a look at the commits here. So you can see, for example, Shailesh added a Jupyter Notebook. I've added quite a few changes. Felix added quite a few uh, bits of information for their session that was earlier today. Right, so the complete commit history. And now you see that the history is quite long. And this is where having a short commit summary message is important because you can quickly go through all of these and see where what, what was changed, all right? So once you've gone to this repository, I want you to click on fork. On the right hand top corner, there should be a button that says fork. I want you to click on fork. Okay, and because I have a few organizations on GitHub, it asks me where I want to fork it to. I want you to fork it to your, to your normal username, and then it should say something of this form. Okay, so now, you have a copy of our repository under your username. This in, in Git and development jargon, this is called a fork. Okay, so it's a copy of the OCNS software working group repository, but in your username, right? So, and if you look at the commit history, it is exactly the same. All it's done is that it's created a copy and put it under your username. So now there are two remotes. Well, there are multiple remotes, right? So there's one remote, which let's say is the primary remote under the OCNS username. I have my remote here, and all of you that have forked this repository should now have your own remotes. And GitHub does this cool thing where it shows you how many people have forked, right? So if I click on four, I can see which people have actually done the forking out of the nine or 10 people that are here, okay? But please try and fork this and follow this because uh, we're going to show you how to open a pull request, which is pretty much um, the most common thing that happens on GitHub nowadays. Okay. Okay, so you should have your own copy of this. And now, instead of starting from zero and initializing a repository for yourself, what you're going to do is you're going to fetch a copy of your fork. So if you go to the green button where it says uh, download button and code, it'll show you URLs. Now for anybody that is not using SSH, so if you've never uploaded some sort of key to GitHub or not aware of what SSH is, click on HTTPS. Okay, and make sure you use an address that starts with HTTPS. Okay, I'm going to use SSH, but you should use HTTPS, okay? 
SSH is only for people that have uploaded something called an SSH key. Okay. So copy your URL, the HTTPS URL. Okay, I'm going to copy my SSH URL. Okay, now um, this is a different repository, so we don't want to merge it into our Git tutorial repo because they're two completely different things. So let's come out. Okay, so go so get out of the folder where we were doing all our work, right? Because that's a different Git repository. You can't merge two Git repositories in this way. And then try this command. So git clone and the URL that you copied from your fork. Okay, for most people, this will be the HTTPS URL, not the SSH URL. Okay, when we do that, it should say something of this sort. Okay, so it should say cloning, and then it'll show you some information about the amount of the amount of data that has traveled, uh, been pulled down. And then if you run ls, you will see that you now have a repository called software, software working group events, wherever you've cloned. Right, we can now enter this repository using CD. We can do all the bits that we've done before, right? And you can see the git commit tree for this. Okay. And now what we want to do is, let's say we want to make a change. So if you go into this folder, 2021 CNS, that's the folder where we're storing information for this conference, right? You'll see different folders for these three tutorials that we're hosting. You can go into the Git folder. Okay, so you're in wherever you were initially, where you cloned this repository then the folder name for this repository that you've just cloned. Then you go into the CNS repository for this particular conference. And then you can go into the Git, 02 Git repository. That is where we're storing information for this particular tutorial. All right, uh, there's only a readme file. What I want you to do is to create a new file. Okay, but before that, Let's create a new branch. So I'm just going to name the branch Ankur, okay? So what I've done here is that in the main branch on the latest commit that we've just pulled, right? So we cloned, it cloned the whole tree. We are at the top of this tree. I've checked out a new branch called Ankur based on my name, right? I'm just going to create a file here that says I'm going to just name it uncode.txt. Okay, so as expected, I now have a new file. Git diff will not show me anything because I haven't started tracking this file. Git status will show me that there's a file that's not yet been tracked. I'm going to add this file and I'm going to commit this file. Okay. So now if you do git log, okay, you can now see that we were on main, we created a new branch and we added a new file and committed it, okay? And now let's push, so let's do 
Okay, so we're pushing this new branch that we've created to our copy of the repository. Okay, if you manage this so far, GitHub will, well, Git will show you a message that GitHub has sent saying, you've pushed a new branch and you want to open a pull request. If you go to the web page for your fork, it will also show you over there that Ankur, the branch you just created, has recent pushes and it'll allow you to compare and open a pull request. Okay, I'm going to maximize this. So what we're doing now, a pull request is a request to merge something. So what we're saying here is that we want to merge this new branch that we've created in our fork to the main branch in the main base repository, right? So from this remote, which is our copy of the, the, the original remote, we want to merge this branch, whatever branch you made, to the actual remote for the OCNS repo, right? And we want to merge it to the main branch over there, right? And it'll show you the change. It'll show you that you created a new commit with a new file, and you can click here to create a pull request. Once you've done this, you can then see your pull request in the main repo. Right, so this is now a pull request. All right. So folks that are uh, working on the remotes, if you can open a pull request, that will be great. That will be the last thing we do today. It will be good practice for you. Okay, Zara, I'll repeat the whole process, no worries. Um, Zach, is that still when it's blinking or is that... Right, try control C once or twice again, see if that fixes it. Okay, I, um, sometimes it updates certain properties of your terminal. So the easiest thing to fix it is just close your git bash and open it again. Unfortunately, this is one of those things that is easier to um, close and open than to try and fix. Okay, I'm going to go to the pull request workflow again. So go to the main software working group repository. I'm putting the URL in the chat. Okay. If you open that web page, on the right hand top corner, you'll see fork. If you click that, it'll ask you where you want to fork it. So I already have a fork, it'll tell me that. Okay. Once it's finished creating a fork, which is just a copy of this repository, you will see a page like this. So you'll see your own copy of the repository. So it'll, it'll show you on the top left corner, your username and the name of the repository. And it will state that this has been forked from OCNS, the, the main repository that belongs to the OCNS user. Okay, so now you have your own fork of the repository. A fork is again, just a copy of somebody else's repository. Okay, once you have this, click on code. So this is the URL for this particular remote. Okay, previously we created a local repository and then added a remote. Here we are not creating a repository and adding a remote. We are just going to, we already have an existing remote and we're going to pull it onto a local machine. So for you, for most of you that don't have SSH keys, use the HTTPS URL, which means click here on HTTPS and copy this. Okay, then in your terminal, a 
okay, you don't want to do this inside another Git repository. So if you're still in uh, the tutorial repository that you, you were using before, come out of it using cd space dot dot, or just close your um, terminal or bash for windows or whatever and just open it again and you should be in your home folder. Right, so for example, I'm in my home folder. And I'm just quickly going to remove the clone I already did. Uh, hold on. Okay, and then, so you've copied the, the address of the remote, that's your fork. What we want to do now is we want to pull it to a local machine. So we're going to do git clone and the URL that you've copied, right? So git clone and HTTPS, whatever, whatever. Okay. Um, in my case, I'm going to use uh, the SSH URL because my system is set up that way. Okay, so I'm going to you'll do the same thing, but you'll do it with the HTTPS URL. I'm going to do it with my SSH URL. Okay, you don't need to worry about the difference between HTTPS and SSH at the time being. When you do this, you'll see that it says cloning into, and then you'll see that it has, it's created a new folder Okay, that's the name of the repository. So you'll see a new folder, that's the name of this repository, and you'll be able to go into it. Okay, I'll wait a minute or two for everybody to get this far. Okay, so if you've all managed to clone, you should be able to run all your usual commands in this repo. So git log all um, graph one line, and then that is now going to show you the history of this particular repository. Okay, so we forked a repository, which means we made a copy of the repository for ourselves. Then we've cloned our fork which means we've downloaded the repository onto our local machine. And then you have a repository like you had before, and you can run all of your usual commands in here. So for example, here you can see git log all graph, and this shows you now the commit graph for this particular repository, right? And you can see that we started with this repository and then we've added quite a few things. We have multiple branches. Some of them have been merged, some of them haven't and so on. Okay. And now what we want to do is we want to, let's say contribute a change to this particular repository, right? So ideally what we do is we create a new branch. So call this branch, whatever you want really. Um, if, if you're contributing to another repository, it's generally good to um, use a, a name that tells people what this branch is about. So for example, you can say git checkout minus bcns tutorial. Uh, 
Okay, the previous command was and then CD Okay, so we've created a copy of the main remote, which is our fork. We've cloned our fork. We can now look at the complete history of this repository. And we can now create a new branch locally using git checkout minus b and name of the branch. When you've done that, it will now tell you that it has switched to this new branch as it did before. If you run the log command again, right? If you run git log one line again, it will show you that this new branch that I created is where head is, and this is where main is, right? So origin is the name of the remote by default. So it's showing us that our local branch is at the same place where the local copy of main is. And it's also the same place as main is on the remote that is called origin. Okay, I'll repeat that. What it's telling us here in this line is that the new branch that we've just created, CNS tutorial, is at the tip, so is at the head of the tree. And it's also telling us that this is also where our local copy of the main branches of the primary branch that we cloned. And this is also where main is on the remote and the remote is called origin, right? So it's telling us a few things. It's telling us about the current branch, telling us the other branches that are the same place. And it's also telling us about where the state of the remote. By default, the remote is called origin. You can change this, but generally you don't need to. Okay, so now that we've created a new repository, uh, we've created a new branch in the repository. If you run ls, you'll be able to look at the files in the repository. You can then enter the git repository. So this is uh, the git folder, sorry. So this is just a folder that we've created to store information about this particular tutorial. Okay, so that's cd for change directory, and then the path to the directory you want to change into. Okay, then if you run pwd, right, pwd is present working directory. Okay, so just tells you where you are. You'll see that you are now in the software working group events folder, which is the repository, and in there you are inside the folder for CNS 2021. And in there, you are in the folder for this session, that's 02 underscore git. Okay. What we'd like to do now is to add a file in here. So let's say, Right, you can name the file whatever you wish, really. We're not really worried about that right now. Uh, I'll paste this command, but please change it as you need to. Okay, and this creates a new file called Ankur. And you can see that this file has the one line in here. Right. And then we want to do the same thing. So we want to tell git, so it's the usual commands again. Um, we use git add to tell git to track this file. I use git status to check whether this file has been um, added or has been staged for git to commit. 
and then I can add a commit message. Right, I'm just adding a toy message for the time being. Okay, so it's, it's, very, it's the same thing as what we did in the first uh, hour of the session. You've created a new file in there, in a new branch, you've added the file, you will use git status to check what you've done. And once you are ready, you commit this with a particular commit message. Now that you have this commit, you can, again, if you want, you can check again what it looks like. All right, the command remains the same. And now you'll see that we were at main before, and now that we've added a new commit, we've diverged. So our parent remains main, but we now have a new commit in a new branch that we just created called CNS tutorial. Okay. Now the next step is this new commit that we have locally on our local machines. The next step is to push this to our fork, to our remote. And you'll do this the same way you had done it before. You do git push origin, which is the name of our fork, as you can see here, origin, and then the name of the branch, right? So it's git push origin and whatever you had used as the name of your branch. All right, if pushing does work for you, um, hopefully it does by now, it'll give you a message of this sort, right? So it'll tell you that you pushed something and it'll tell you that there's different branch and you can create a pull request for this branch, okay? And um, if you hadn't noticed on in my web browser on the web page for this fork, it also tells me the CNS tutorial, this branch has just had recent pushes, okay? So I can then click compare and open pull request, All right? And it'll bring you to a page like this. And what we're doing here is a pull request is you asking the owner of a repository to merge your branch into their repository. Okay, so you have, uh, there's the OCNS remote, which is the actual repository that you want to contribute to. You forked that, so you have a copy of this repository on your, for yourself. You have a copy of this repository on GitHub as a remote. You have a copy of this repository on your local machine. You've done some work on your local machine in a new branch, okay? You've pushed this to your remote, to your fork. And now you, you're asking the people at OCNS. So in this case, Joe, Shalesh, and me, and other people from the working group to merge your contributions into the main repository. That is a pull request. Okay, so you're asking somebody to accept your contribution from a different branch into their main repository, okay? And GitHub will tell you this quite clearly. So it's telling you that it's telling you that you're trying to merge from this repository. So this is my fork. In your pull request, it should show your username over here. And this branch in your fork, right? So they're calling this the head repository. So we, we, we're asking to merge our branch, see in this tutorial on our fork, that is our copy, into the main branch in the base repository. So that is the OCNS actual primary repository, right? So that is a pull request. Under the hood, all this is doing is you have the branch and it's 
giving a web interface to the owners of the OCNS repository to, to merge, right? It can also be done in a terminal, right? But this is a convenient interface. So it shows, you, you can give some um, note to your pull request, you can add some Right. Oh, that's great, Zara. Yes. Um, just let me click, click, pull, uh, create pull request, and then we'll go and merge yours. Okay. I'll maximize this. Uh, it shows you that there's one commit in this pull request because uh, ideally your branch could have lots and lots of commits that you want to merge. Um, and this shows you the diff over here. You can see it either in a unified way, so the way that we've been seeing on the terminal or you can see it in a split view, which means on the left, it shows you the old version of the file and on the right, it shows you the new version of the file. So on the left, the file didn't exist because I created this new file, it shows nothing. On the right, it shows the one line that I've added. Uh, again, it shows you what line number this was added at, right? It's called the context. And then I'm going to click here and say, create pull request, okay? Sara, I don't see your pull request. Can you um, send me the link to your pull request? Hold on, let me have a quick look at your fork. So the good thing about GitHub is that we can also see everybody's forks. So I can go to Zara's fork here. Right, and I can look at uh, different branches. So Zara, I do, I do see your branch and I do see your commit, but I don't, uh, did you click on create pull request to actually create the final pull request? Oh, great, so let's have a look. Ah, and there you go. So you can see that there are three pull requests. Zara's pull request has now turned up, okay? And as you see, Zara's changed, a, well, Zara's only changed the one file, but uh, is based on an older commit. So it'll show us all of these commits, which is perfectly all right. It doesn't really mean anything, okay? Right, so this is our pull request. And if I want to merge this, I'll click merge pull request over here. Right? I won't merge it now because I'm not uh, completely sure of what changes we've made here. Okay, but so this is how a code review happens. You open a pull request and then people will go through what commits you've made and what changes you've made. For example, all of this here. And then when they're happy with it, they might even ask you to make more changes. Okay, and when all of that is done, then they'll click pull request. Thanks, George. Uh, we are pretty much at the end. We've crossed the three hour mark. So um, that is the last thing I'm going to show people today. Um, okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Uh, hopefully everybody has the various commands noted down or in the chat and so on. Uh, we will make the recording available. We will make uh, this notebook that I was writing on the side available with this. So people that weren't able to attend will be able to attend this later. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Um, we're already over time, but we've got a few minutes if anybody has any comments to make. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you wish, but otherwise we will um, close in a few minutes. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now.